No, this one is about relationship, marriage, and reunion. Communica we'll talk a little bit about communication, even though you just had a class on that. Um, intimacy a little bit, and then reintegration. And um, when you first got, uh, I don't know how it was when you, when you were dating, and some of the stuff I say today is very generalized, so uh, it might not be specific for your spouse, but uh, it's kind of a generalization how we usually are in our relationships. And um, if, when you first start dating, uh, this great adventure of false advertising. You know, it's when your husband used deodorant and combed his hair and all this kind of stuff, you know, for the first time and uh, wanted to be his best every day and um, become this knight in shining armor. And sometimes we're like that as guys. We come into a dating relationship and we want to be that knight. We see this damsel in distress and we just want to be her savior. You know, put her on the back of our horse and ride off into the, into the sunset and everything is going to be wonderful. On the other hand, ladies usually love projects, and we see our, our spouse, and they're our little project that we can change. We can fix them, and everything that's wrong with them, we can fix them. Now, that's not for all, but sometimes that's the way it is. What happens, though, is then you get married, and for the, uh, the guy who's the knight in shining armor, suddenly he changes that whole uniform from a knight to a bellhop, and now he's just carrying around luggage all the time, you know, the baggage that we came into our relationship with. Because sometimes we have baggage. Sometimes we have things that happen in our lives that we haven't worked through yet, the things that we haven't fully kind of, you know, resolved. And we still deal with that in our marriages. And, um, and as far as fixing the project, well, once you get married, somehow as guys we think that suddenly there's a lot of nagging going on because then suddenly we hear about all the stuff that's not perfect and you're still trying to fix us. And we're like, well, you know, I don't want this. And it becomes nagging. But before, it was wonderful. You know, even the guy thought it was wonderful that, you know, my girlfriend just loves me so much and I'm, I've learned so much. And, and it's true because you ladies are, are exper experts on relationships and us guys are not. Okay, and so when we marry you, we kind of, you know, um, get some of that expertise from you. And that's why sometimes as married guys, we do a lot better of our jobs because suddenly we realize this whole thing of relationships and we are better at it uh, once we become married. But then also, you, when you do get married, you stand at this altar in front of the pastor or, or rabbi or priest or on the beach or at the courthouse, and you have this wonderful vow that you say, you know, for rich or poor, you know, sickness and health, you know, good times and bad times, till death do us part. And then suddenly you are, have this kiss, you're introduced to the to your family and everything's wonderful, the party, the honeymoon, and everything is wonderful, all right? But something changes, and this is what happens. See, I didn't realize that when my, when my wife stood at the altar with me, that she had been dreaming since she was a, just a little girl about all the things that marriage would be, all the things that our life would entail. And she had written this 17th volume encyclopedia about all the things that it meant for us to be married. What it is like, what her husband was going to be like, and what he would do for her, and how he would treat the kids, and then what kind of dad he would be, and what would happen to him if he lost his hair. So there's a whole chapter on hair growth and hair, hair loss and all this kind of stuff, you know. And the only, there's only one problem with that. The problem with the encyclopedia is that they are totally and completely invisible. I did not see them. Okay? Us guys, we have some expectation out of marriage too, but it's usually a bulletin insert. Okay? Uh, there's only a few things that we guys uh, really want from marriage. Okay? And uh, two important ones, food, and then the other one is usually sex. And uh, when we get that out of marriage, it's usually pretty good for us. We're like, yeah, that's awesome. All right? And you're like, you're like, you're like I can't believe you're so shallow. That's all you want? Well, yeah, that's really, we're kind of simple Neanderthal kind of guys, you know. And what? <laughs> laundry, yeah. If somebody can do our laundry, that'd be wonderful too. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I won't tell you that I was 21 when I finally had to do my own laundry. I was able to talk my mom into doing my laundry until I was like in the third year of college. <laughs> and then she realized we had a washer and dryer and the dormitory. And then she said, you got to do your own stuff. I said, okay, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> so, but laundry is a good thing too. But we only have a couple things. And what happens is that we have all these expectations when it comes to marriage. But a lot of times we don't communicate those expectations. And what happens in a lot of relationships over time is that we have all these expectations of what we want our, our spouse to do, 
and then for some reason they don't follow through 100% on those expectations. And what happens is that every time he doesn't take out the garbage or he doesn't give you breakfast in bed or he doesn't give you that bag grub that you wanted or because he's too tired or rather than cleaning the garage on a Sunday, Saturday he is lying on the couch watching football or whatever. Every time he does that and he doesn't meet those expectations that you have in that 17 volume encyclopedia, what happens is that each time our heart gets broken a little bit. I remember the first time when when uh, I came home, my wife was a kindergarten teacher, and for some strange reason, I don't understand, she was tired and didn't feel like sex. And I'm like, what? Why not? That's what we got married for, you, my pamphlet, remember? And, and then it happened not only once, it happened twice, it happened more than three times. I'm like, what? is going on, you know, and, and I was an idiot, but my heart was broken a little because I was, that's what I wanted and needed, and now it's not happening all the time, and even Oprah says it should happen so many times a week. I don't know, what listener, you know, like, come on. Yeah, I know. But it's because we have these expectations and I wonder sometimes, though, you and I, or maybe you have these expectations of what's going to happen when he comes home. What are the things that you expect from when he walks through the door to what's going to happen? And I wonder sometimes, there's thinking the possibility that some of our expectations may not be realistic, may not be what he's thinking. And I wonder that maybe we need to think about what those expectations are. What are his expectations when he walks through the door? You know, I heard a little bit about it this morning in the, in the meeting and a lot of the good stuff, but what if his expectation is he's gonna walk through the door and he's gonna go to his man cave and reside there for a while? What if his, his expectations is that every night when he comes home, he's gonna go down and meet with the guys from downrange and go drinking? Um, what if that is his, his expectation? You know, and you're thinking in your mind, he's got another thing coming. That's his <laughs> expectation, right? And rightfully so. But have you talked about it? Have you shared what your expectations are for when he walks home, walks in those doors? And I would say let the expectations be realistic on both sides of the aisle. Are they realistic? And then secondly, be patient. Heard that this morning in our in our in our meeting. Be patient. Um, there's even a scripture that says, uh, "Wait, wait upon the Lord." So if I got to be patient with God, and my husband is definitely not God, then maybe I need to be patient with him, and allow him to understand some of these expectations and communicate through them. And that that's with communication is our third part, is to be you know be able to talk about it or. or tell one another. And maybe you need to write them down. What are your expectations? Maybe you need to sit down before going to bed tonight and just write down the expectations of what you want from him when he comes home. And maybe you need to let him know, hey, honey, what do you expect from us? What do you expect from when you walk through the door? And you might literally be very amazed that actually his expectation is he's going to watch, you know, all the NCI episode he missed this last year or whatever his thing is. And, you know, and drink beer for next two, I don't know, you know, whatever it is that he does, okay? Um, Can we just ask like that? Yeah, you could, you could ask. <laughs> yeah, honey, um, you know, I went to this conference and that's <laughs> and, and guys, it's harder for guys because the guys aren't touchy-feely, you know, but maybe he's, he's thinking about what it's going to be like when he gets home. Uh, I tell you one thing, I went uh, home on, uh, on some leave earlier this, uh, this year in April uh, for about a week and uh, my wife had expectations of a honey-do list, okay, of all the things that went by the wayside while I was gone since October. And it wasn't a whole lot, but there was a bunch of stuff. And half of the stuff I could do and the other half, I couldn't. And the other half of the other half, I didn't even want to do. You know, I'm like, I'm here at home. I just want to relax and be with my girls. I got three daughters, and I just want to spend time with them. I don't want to be spend time doing this kind of stuff, you know. But she had those expectations. So even on RR, I had those expectations that we just didn't. And the thing was, we didn't communicate. We didn't say this was what's going to happen. 
actually she did communicate a little bit of the honey do list. I just wasn't into listening too much <laughs> about that. And that's, that's the hard part for us guys also, all right? So expectations, make them realistic, be patient, write them down. Both of you t take time out. And then sometimes you might say, but, but writing them down and being like that is going to take all the spontaneity out of it. He should know what's expected. He should know me. He should know exactly what he should do. I should not have to write it out for him. I should not even have to tell him. He should just know everything that, that needs to happen. All right? Um, that takes the romance right out of the whole thing because it's just, you know, it needs to be romantic. It needs to all happen. Because, you know, there's nothing more anti-romantic than what? It starts with an M. Monopoly? No. Nope. Monopoly. <laughs> That's true, that's true. No, marriage. There's nothing more anti-romantic than <laughs> marriage, you know. Right. I mean, seriously, there was, a guy, there was a guy that was married for less than a week and was in the counselor's office. He wanted a divorce from his wife. And the counselor's like, why do you want a divorce? You just got married last weekend. He says, well, because on our honeymoon night, she was all pretty in her dress, and then she went into the bathroom to get ready. And she made funny noises. <laughs> and the cow's looking at you like you're looking at me like, like, are you serious? Yeah, he, in his mind, his princess never farted, never had any kind of, you know, odor of any kind that was, you know, or made noises. And it just broke his whole image of the romantic woman that he would marry. And this is a true story. And I'm not making this up. And sometimes we have the romance in things and we want everything to be perfect. But marriage is full of funny noises and things we don't want to do. And, and you know, it, it, it's reality of life. The reality sets in. Okay? doesn't mean you can't be romantic, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, our spouses are moving from a war zone to El Paso. Okay, it looks the same. Um, you know, but they're moving from a war zone to a place where nobody's look, really looking over their shoulders and people are going on and being able to drive where they want and not being afraid of, of, of being in war or having bombs go off or a roadside IED or those type of things. Okay? Um, I remember a couple of weeks ago we were in uh, Washington, D.C. at the hospital um, and we came back, we were in the subway, and people all around us started coughing like crazy. They were looking at the police officers standing there going, oh, oh, oh. and the three of us from El Paso were just standing there going, okay, it kind of tickles, but it's all right. You know, we had dust storms before. It's all right, you know, I don't know if it was anthrax, anthrax attack or not. I don't know what it was. Maybe crummy food to maybe your wonderful food. He's going to a place where he eats where there are a few rules to where there are rules of the family, you know, and dealing with, I don't know who's around your dining room table or spending time together and that kind of stuff, to suddenly having a family. I mean, one of the nice things about me, my family being my wife and my kids being in California, is that I can work late and it's not going to affect anybody else except me. Okay, I can, I can stay late at the, at the office or if somebody wants to talk or an FRG meeting goes on, I have no problem going there because there's nobody at home waiting for me with dinner or, hey, we had plans to go do this with so-and-so tonight or, you know, you're supposed to take the kids here or do whatever. And they're in a single lifestyle in a sense. And it's not in the sense of relationship-wise, but as far as obligations and things that, that are important. All they have to care about is their own bunk, their own place where they work, their own life. And, you know, they're in this world where it's kind of like, yeah, sure, the army does stuff, but there's no family. So you got to be careful that, that we become, you know, patient and, and let them kind of get back into that realization where, oh yeah, I got to care about all these people that are suddenly around me or a part of my life. And everything I do has an effect on, on, on them also. Okay? Did you miss that for R&R? &R? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's gonna come, you're going to come back to a little bit of honeymoon period. But what is the honeymoon period? If you think back what the honeymoon period was, you know? Now, personally, as a chaplain, I believe your honeymoon period in your marriage doesn't need to end after you come back from Hawaii or we went to Disney World or you're going to go, you know? Um, but the honeymoon period is kind of a period where you don't have to pay your visa bill and everything is wonderful. We can just hold hands and, you know, walk through life and just enjoy everything that's around us without being in the realism that, hey, the car needs oil change and uh, we need to go get groceries. And uh, by the way, um, you know, we have a doctor's appointment today and, and all this kind of stuff. Okay. So the honeymoon period will end, which it gets into the expectations of intimacy. 
you know, um, somebody said one time, we had a hard time just feeling like we knew each other. Mrs. Snuffy said, who had employed several times, it was like there was a stranger in the house. Even if we were physically intimate, we would really didn't feel connected. I haven't met anybody who just bounces right back. Okay? And that can happen sometimes. When you're intimate, you're just like, you haven't been together in a long time. And it was like, well, we're two strangers. Okay, yeah, we have this, this event that just happened, but I really don't feel any closer. You know? And as guys, we need to realize that it's not about the act of being intimate, but that there's a lot more involved. Now, when somebody comes off the plane, you don't necessarily have you know, time to really get to know one another or just have a romantic dinner or stuff, you know, because usually he's tired or whatever. Um, but there is that aspect of getting into, into one another's hearts, you know, of, of getting into your heart and understanding you and having those moments again and building up that intimacy. And that takes time. And so maybe you need to take some time and do some dating, you know. I don't know if that's important or if that's possible. I know that's easy to say when it's just the two of you. Uh, it's a little bit harder if you have little kids because, um, you know, it's not really legal to tie them up, um, you know, give them a lot of NyQuil so they'll sleep, um, you know. I've got to be careful what I'm saying because I'm being taped right now. So. <laughs> but it is important that you, that you take time for one another, especially even if you have a family. The most important relationship that you have in this world is your spouse and you. Okay? And uh, you might say, well, no, with my kids. I'll do anything. Well, it's important. Our kids are important, but our kids wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And your kids wouldn't be healthy and strong if it wasn't for the strength of your relationship. And I don't know where you come from. I don't know what your family was like. But if you've gone through a divorce at all with parents, then you know what that does to kids and how their foundation is totally cracked and shattered at times because mom and dad didn't take care of their relationship. And whatever it was that broke that, you know, there's an array of things that could happen. But ultimately, it's your relationship that is strong. So they take some diet time to date. Take some time to be together. Take some time to really enjoy one another like you did when you first went out. There's, some, there's a reason why you're together. There's a reason why he, he, he got your heart. You know, there's a reason why you said yes. Um, and I hope that those times, the moment, the reason why you said yes is, is a positive reason. <laughs> and that, you know, you can say, hey, yeah, we need to rebuild some of that because we haven't had that in a long time. Take time, invest, make it a priority. Do some common things together, common activities that you like doing together. Maybe it's working out together. Maybe it's going for a long walk. Maybe it's going on a bike ride. Maybe it's whatever it is. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to be a long weekend away, but it's something you can do together to find commonality in your relationship, to find a place where you can start again and, and work on that, all right? When you communicate, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but be open and honest with one another. Um, yeah. Be honest and, and tell him what you want. Okay? You need to tell a guy more than once what you want. Because the guys are sometimes very dense when it comes to communication. And we need to hear it more than once. Be fun. Have playful moments. Okay? Bring romance back. Okay? It doesn't mean that you can't be romantic in marriage, but it takes some work. It takes time to put the candles up and to make a nice dinner, to have Barry, Barry White, I was going to say Barry Manilow, and say, honey, you need to come home you know, right after formation today, because okay? it's on. <laughs> It's on, you know? And he might need to be that night. This is, sorry, sorry, I gotta go home. Do what a man's gotta do. That's crazy, good, good. All right, get it out of there. Now, sometimes stuff happens and, and yeah, it could ruin that moment, but, but make, make time for that, okay? Um, verbalize the great things that you have for each other. If you have a family, talk about things. I, I tell guys, I wish that your spouses was here because I would, I would want to tell them some stuff. But tell each other in public what you like about one another. You know, when you're with friends, you know, I'm so glad he's back because he just, he's my all. You know, he's my, I'm, you know, I feel so much safer when he's here. You know, um, there's many times when in front of my family at room, dining room table, I will tell in front of my kids, honey, I'm so, girls, I'm so proud of your mom. She's just an awesome mom, just how she takes care of us all and goes, to, goes the extra mile. And my kids need to hear that from me as a dad. Kids need to hear that from a mom about their dad. 
you know, even though at times it's not always positive. And you don't always have the feely moments where that's wonderful, you know. And then when it comes down to intimacy, a lot of times it's like that too, where we have a tough week and it's not easy to be intimate, you know. And sometimes we're, we're pretty dense and go, okay, let's go do it. And you're like looking at them going, like, are you serious? This has been a horrible week and you do want to do what? You know, that's kind of like the person at the end of the Super Bowl that's lost, walks in the room and goes, oh, that's a, I know we lost, but you know, it's not how you played. It's not how you, how much you, how many points you have. It's how you play the game. And you know, everybody else in the room is looking at him going, I'm going to kill you right now. <laughs> I really believe as, as a, me as a, a Christian chaplain, I look at, at life, there are two places where I totally feel safe. It's called a sanctuary. You know, sometimes we think of a sanctuary as a church, and it is a church, you know. That's where you used to get sanctuary. Remember when the cops were looking for you or somebody, you can go into the safe. You have a place of sanctuary where your troubles no longer followed you. And I do find that in my relationship with my God, that sometimes in, in moments of worship or prayer or uh, that I find that um, I'm in a safe place where I trust that my God will take care of my issues and uh, where I don't have to worry about some things. And there's been times when I've had great burdens about stuff and I give them over to my God and in that moment suddenly my whole view of life changes. But I also believe that God has given us a sanctuary in our, in our marriage, in that in moment of intimacy with our spouse. And when you come together that very moment that somehow the rest of the, whatever goes on in the rest of the world no longer matters. You have that moment of intimacy and I would say really protect that place. Protect that place of intimacy with your spouse and let it be one of those places where you just kind of hide from the, moment, from the world, even if it's for 5, 10, 20 minutes, whatever it is, you know, that you have a place where you can be safe together. And uh, so, so when it comes to intimacy, be realistic about what's going to happen. Remember, he's trying to get back with you also. It doesn't mean that there's been guys that come back from deployment and they can't do anything. Their mind is like they're trying to get back into, into your relationship together. And, you know, he's human, just like you. And you just, you know, have to get into that moment. Sometimes it's no big deal, no problem at all. But it can be, you know. But be patient. Be patient with what you expect from that relationship. Okay? Um, about getting into one another's heart. And then communicate what you want. Communicate what you like. Communicate in some way. Maybe a note in his lunch or something. Or, you know, in just that moment. If you find that moment, it's hard. And then lastly, expectations on communication. There are four deadly sins. Uh, but let me just say, God made uh, uh, Eve. Uh, I don't know if you know the story, but he took a rib out of Adam. And that was the same rib with which Adam used to read minds. And so we no longer read minds. And so uh, that's what you guys do. And uh, so uh, be careful, <laughs> be, be sensitive with us that we don't read your mind and we don't know. We're very dense people, okay? And uh, we need to be told more than once. Uh, we need to be asked more than once. And uh, when you communicate, don't assume that he knows what you want or expect. Uh, I don't know. My wife always asks me, where do you want to eat? I don't know, where do you want to eat? Where do you want to eat? If I could read your mind, I'd already be there, okay? I don't know what we're going to eat. So don't assume that he knows what you want or expect. Okay, number two is um, begging for him to give you what you want, okay? Don't, don't beg. Um, it's not going to work with him. Guys are, are, are takers. You know this about guys, but guys are takers. We love to take. You ladies, and a lot of you are givers. It's really hard for you to take, okay? It's easier for you to give. And there's times when I have spouses in my office who said, you know, I've given everything to him, and I just had to have nothing more to give. And he's looking and going, yeah, so far it's working out, great, you know? Because guys take. When, we're, when, you know, when you see guys that are taken, taken, taken from each other, they don't give stuff away. They're always taken from what they want, what they want to get done. You know, uh, we're just like, oh, and we, we take stuff. Okay, we don't. Yeah, yeah, we're just, yeah, that's me, man. Okay, I'm, I'm going to. Um, so have some things that you want from him. Have some conditions at times uh, when you want something from him, when you communicate. It's okay to have conditions. Everything in this world has conditions. There is no such thing in this world as an unctional relationship that is healthy, okay? If you give everything to your kids that they want, 
at the time that they want it, you're going to raise some hellions. You're going to raise people that will not care about anybody else except themselves. Okay? And so same thing with your spouses. Sometimes you just got to take a little bit from them and not always give, which sometimes means you got to let them know what you want and don't budge from it. Now, you got to be careful that your relationship is strong enough that you can do that, okay? Because sometimes you can be seen, if you do that a lot, you can be seen as being stubborn and selfish and a other word I don't want to say, and then you know, all this stuff comes out. And, you know, yeah. Okay, number three, convincing. Try to, give him, or try to make him feel the way you do, okay? He's not a woman. He's not going to feel the way you feel. Okay? We guys have a hard time with feelings. That's not our plane. Okay? Um, I know in my church sometimes the worship leaders say, Oh, I just feel God. Don't you feel God in this place? And then, oh, yes, we feel God. Oh, yeah. And all the guys are like, I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> I feel like I need another cup of coffee. That's, you know, and uh, don't, don't convince him. <laughs> Try to convince him. Okay, number four is um, bullying. Guys, bullying him the way he's feeling. Guys love bullying. He's not going to respond in the way that you want him to respond, okay? Guys always, you ever see guys talk with one another? Insult each other? That's what guys do. You love that. You're an idiot. Oh, yeah, you're stupid. You're fat. Yeah, you're, yeah. Where'd you get that haircut? Ah, <laughs> you know, and all like that. Oh, yeah. You know, that's how we do stuff, right? So, so if you're like to your other, I, you don't want to go clean the garage, you know, that kind of stuff. He's like, oh, okay. no. <laughs> you know, he's not going to respond to that, okay? Um, they can be the man in your relationship, and whether it's patting him on, like, oh, come on, honey, I love you so much, you know, or you're wonderful, or, you know, uh, at times, I don't say to you that I use, you know, SCX for a weapon, but um, it's, it's a great weapon to use. Uh, you girls have so much power over us guys. And it's tr so true, you know, it's, uh, if you want him to clean the garage, all you got to do is walk up to him in the morning and say, you know that thing that you like to do? Yes. He says, well, you go clean the garage, and when you're all done, you come find me. And then, you, <laughs> you know, he'll be out that door. <laughs> First of all, he'll be like, look, are you serious? Are you totally serious? Because he won't believe his ears.